When people think about violent, town-obliterating tornadoes, they often think of Gerald, and rightfully so. The Gerald tornado of 1997 was one of the strongest tornadoes to ever hit the U.S., peeling concrete off of roads and completely sweeping homes off of foundations. It set a new benchmark for how powerful a tornado could possibly be, and the damage from most subsequent modern tornadoes usually pales in comparison. While Gerald was an outlier in sheer strength and power, there's another killer Texas tornado that is an outlier in location. This is a map of the top 10 deadliest tornadoes to ever hit the state of Texas. There's a relatively wide spatial distribution across the eastern half of the state with Gerald landing right here. But you might notice that there's only nine tornadoes on this map. Well, the missing tornado happened right here in the far southwestern quadrant of Texas, a mere 20 miles from the Davis Mountains. This is the tornado that wiped out the small town of Saragossa on May 22nd, 1987, 10 years before Gerald. Before we get into the event, it's important to understand how the geography of Texas impacts tornado climatology across the state. Spanning 760 miles across its east-west axis, the state encompasses several different climate zones. The entire eastern three-quarters of the state is humid subtropical, the northwestern panhandle is cold semi-arid, and the southwestern quadrant is a mixture of hot semi-arid and desert climates. The physical ingredients for tornadoes often come together over the humid subtropical region of the state. Its proximity and orientation to the Gulf of Mexico result in low-level jets bringing in warm, moist air at the surface. The Sonoran Plateau to the west provides dry air aloft, which gets invected eastward by strong westerly flow. When positioned above that surface moisture, you can get explosive, lawn-lasting supercells with violent tornadoes. But it's a bit more difficult to get that gulf moisture transported to the west, which, when looking at a map, it makes sense that the southwestern quadrant of Texas is mostly desert. But it does happen from time to time in the summer months. If a vast area of high pressure sits over the gulf, and there are no other surrounding systems to disrupt its clockwise flow, the moisture will get moved westward into southern Texas and northern Northern Mexico. If the flow around the high is really strong in the summer, then this becomes the tropical easterlies, moisture surges into Arizona, and that triggers a monsoon. This usually happens in July and can trigger flash flooding, haboobs, the whole nine yards. But although moisture gets invected into the desert, the risk for tornadoes has died down because of the lack of wind shear. The flow is easterly both aloft and at the surface. So in order to get a violent tornado in the deserts of southwest Texas, you need easterly surface winds bringing in moisture from the Gulf, but more westerly winds aloft evecting drier air and creating wind shear. And on May 22nd, 1987, those ingredients fell into place. Now, the National Severe Storms Forecasting Center had made large strides in the 1980s in both weather prediction and warning dissemination. The biggest development by far was Nexrad Doppler radar, which offered increased resolution as well as a velocity product that could calculate the motion of particles within a storm. But WSR-88D Nexrad Doppler radar wasn't fully deployed across the country until the 1990s, so most weather offices used the WS. SR-74 system, which while more reliable than systems in the 1960s due to updated electrical components, offered little additional information. That being said, tornadic events within the Great Plains were well known and usually well predicted by the 1980s. The Wichita Falls tornado eight years earlier was a good example of that. Meteorologists recognized the potential for a tornado outbreak and successfully issued a tornado watch for the area in question several hours before a tornado touched down. Warnings, on the other hand, weren't great, but lead time was actually positive in the 1980s, albeit just over five minutes on average. To physically receive a warning, many people in cities relied on television and radio broadcast, and in rural areas, many people unfortunately relied on hearing sirens. A smaller portion of the population owned a NOAA weather radio in the 1980s, which would emit a tone if a warning was issued. But that portion of the population was quite small. In several surveys taken by random consumers in shopping malls in 1985, only about 20% were familiar with NOAA weather radio. That was mainly NOAA's fault. They had failed to promote NWR in any sort of advertisement campaign to the public. What was advertised in the late 1980s was a new cable channel that would broadcast weather 24-7 and included all warnings issued by the National Weather Service. This was, of course, the Weather Channel, but once again, many rural communities didn't have access to cable in the mid-1980s. 
And now we can apply this to the unincorporated town of Saragossa. Located 90 miles southwest of Odessa in the hot semi-arid region, it is on the fringes of the Odessa Midland television market. Analog television stations, which broadcast on VHF and UHF, have a typical range of about 60 miles. But luckily, Saragossa was able to receive multiple television stations with decent reception. The same can be said for FM radio stations in the area. However, Saragossa was covered by several radio transmitters located 30 miles away in Pecos. Reeves County, Texas contained only 14,000 people in 1987, and Saragossa barely contained 180. The economy in that area of Texas revolves around agricultural and mineral production, as well as tourism. Reeves County in particular is the area that many of those old western cowboy movies tried to depict. Many families who lived in Saragossa would commute to Pecos, a much larger town 30 miles to the north. Most of the families living there were Mexican, and three quarters of them only spoke Spanish. Because Saragossa was unincorporated and predominantly Spanish, some residents felt like they were being systematically ignored. There were no sirens or public emergency systems. In fact, one year prior in 1986, surplus emergency sirens were offered to Saragossa and the surrounding towns of Toya and Belmaray. But Saragossa was the only town that didn't accept the offer. In fact, they didn't even respond at all. All of this unfortunately came to a head on May 22, 1987. The threat for severe weather was well recognized by the National Severe Storms Forecasting Center. At the surface, light winds were blowing out of the east, bringing in moisture to west central Texas. A trough of low pressure aloft was pushing its way eastward throughout the day, and a jet streak with 70 knot winds was moving over western Texas by the afternoon. The tremendous wind shear was favorable for rotating updrafts, and the high cape allowed for explosive thunderstorms with the threat for damaging hail. Northwestern Texas was placed in the slight risk zone, with Reeves County just to the southwest. But at 2.12 p.m., that polygon was extended westward to include Reeves County. Throughout the afternoon, a weak outflow boundary from earlier storms in northern Texas began to drift to the south and would act like a makeshift dry line to help initiate the storms. You can see the clear change in temperature and dew point along this line. At 3.11 p.m., a severe thunderstorm watch was issued for most of western Texas, and slow-moving thunderstorms began firing along the New Mexico border. One of these storms was located in far southwestern Reeves County, and from all given accounts I could find, this storm would go on to sustain itself for nearly five hours. A severe thunderstorm warning was issued until 4.30 p.m. for Reeves County, with the storm tops falling soon after, a sign of a weakening updraft. When we talk about storm echo tops, we are referring to the height of the top of a thunderstorm. This often correlates with storm intensity. The higher the top, the more air is being sucked into the storm, the higher the updraft, resulting in a more intense downdraft that contains rain, wind, and hail. In this case, the Reeves County storm went from a 50,000 foot echo top to 37,000 feet by 5 p.m. There were several other severe storms. One in particular west of Lubbock was the result of very strong moisture convergence near the surface. But this is once again where topography may have played an important role in Reeves County. It was thought by many that the Davis Mountains kept tornadoes away from the area because they disrupt the low level flow of moisture. But when easterly winds were strengthening throughout the afternoon, they backed into the Davis Mountains, which likely steered them to the north. This convergence of moisture likely aided in the intense intensification of the Reeves County storm in the 6 o'clock hour. By 6.41 p.m., the storm top had risen to 51,000 feet and was a full-fledged supercell by 7.20. At this point, NWS Midland had called the Pecos Department of Public Safety to get information on the stationary thunderstorm. After doing so, they issued a severe thunderstorm and flash flood warning until 9.45 p.m., over two hours into the future. Within the next 10 minutes, onlookers in Balmeray noticed a lowering wall cloud a few miles to the west. The circulating wall cloud and dangling scud were violently careening around the parent center at over 100 miles an hour. Storm spotters reported this phenomena to the weather office and a tornado warning was issued at 7.54 p.m. At around this time, a very short-lived F0 tornado touched down just to the north of Balmeray, lifting before crossing I-10. Don Ingram, driving along Route 17, captured these images of the stovepipe tornado shortly after touching down. Landing just to the north of Interstate 10, the tornado grew in size, moving north-northeast at around 30 miles per hour. 
Three miles away in its direct path was the town of Saragossa, where many surrounding residents were gathered in Guadalupe Hall to celebrate children who had graduated from the Head Start program. What was supposed to be a memorable evening for parents and their children was unfortunately cut short. One mile outside of town, this tornado lifted, and a third tornado, this time a multiple vortex monster with winds over 200 miles per hour, touched down. This photo, taken from Route 17, shows the tornado about one mile outside of Saragossa. At around this point, somebody from within the community center looked outside, saw the tornado approaching, and frantically told all the parents and children in attendance. By most accounts, they had 60 seconds to prepare. You'll notice that this tornado, like many, is surrounded by a curtain of rain. This is called the Bear's Cage, and it's the region of precipitation that surrounds the rotating updraft in a thunderstorm. It's partly what gives the tornado within a supercell that classic hook echo shape on radar. This bear's cage is important because many accounts of survivors in the community center recall hearing about 30 seconds of downpour before all hell broke loose, and that was the result of the bear's cage. And then the tornado hit. Chunks of cement and bent steel began raining down on families inside. Then the southern wall fell, burying everyone in feet of rubble. Many who survived had dove underneath sturdy tables, and that protected them from debris. All of the Head Start children in the community center survived, but that is purely due to the selfless parents and teachers who did lose their lives protecting their children. And unfortunately, the death toll of people just within the community center was 22. Now, the town of Saragossa is laid out in a boomerang shape. The center of the tornado crossed directly over the community center located in the eastern block. All homes, churches, and businesses here were completely destroyed. Cars were flipped and mangled. Some of them were launched a thousand feet into the air. Sheet metal was wrapped around trees. An additional eight people lost their lives here, several of which were in mobile homes. Some lucky few, despite receiving no real warning, were able to outrun the tornado. One such instance was the Candelis family who owned a grocery store on the east side of town. Upon seeing the tornado approach, Jose packed the family in the pickup truck and drove north down Route 17, watching mobile homes fly through the air in the rear view. Of course, upon return, he found a pile of looted rubble. The tornado lifted about a mile northeast of Saragossa. In fact, it was only on the ground for about three miles and lasted a mere 13 minutes. As rescuers poured into Saragossa from across the region, including students from Albuquerque, it became more and more apparent that most people didn't know that this deadly tornado was coming before it was too late. By all measures, the National Weather Service had actually succeeded in issuing a warning ahead of a violent tornado. Derwood Lane, who was living in Balmeray at the time, reported the power going out at exactly 8.20. This is when power lines were severed near a substation a mile north of Saragossa, which should be the exact time the tornado hit the town. That at best is a 26 minute lead time, which is incredible for the 1980s. So what happened? Well, as we discussed before, there were many factors and NOAA weather radio signals did not reach that part of Reeves County. It's unclear whether or not the emergency broadcast system was activated for the tornado warning at 754, which would have interrupted television and radio broadcasts with that scary tone followed by the warning bulletin. An estimated 40 people in Saragossa subscribed to a primitive cable system, but were likely watching Univision, the Spanish station that doesn't carry NWR warnings. Several non-cable and AM radio stations did disseminate the severe thunderstorm, flash flood, and tornado warnings, both in English and Spanish, but it could be as simple as nobody in Saragossa was tuned in. They had better things to do on a Friday night in late spring. Unfortunately, all signs point back to one specific issue, and that is the lack of sirens in Saragossa. Although the reliance on sirens for warnings is extremely problematic today, in this specific situation in 1987, when you have the Weather Service successfully giving you 26 minutes of lead time before a tornado, the sirens would have likely been activated at least 10 minutes before the tornado hit, and that could have really changed the outcome. In fact, once receiving the warning, 16 mobile deputy units across Reeves County were deployed to help keep an eye on the storm. If there was any sort of emergency management in Saragossa, that warning could have been communicated and the sirens would have been activated. Now, three years later in 1990, the Plainfield tornado happened, an F5 that killed 29 that was completely unwarned by the Weather Service. The Sarag Saragossa tornado is more fascinating to me because the Weather Service got it right and gave that 26 minutes of lead time, 
that nobody actually received the warning due to lack of emergency management infrastructure. There's only so much that the weather service can do, and the rest is up to local government. And unfortunately, the local government failed the people of Saragossa that day. One interesting bit that I saw being discussed is that Guadalupe Hall may have been the most structurally sound building in Saragossa, meaning that although 22 people in that hall lost their lives, it may have been much more if they were dispersed throughout the town in their own homes. Saragossa still stands today. The town church, which is the sanctuary of Our Lady of Guadalupe, and the community center were rebuilt along Highway 17, and there's actually a storm center that was installed inside of the community center meant to withstand an F4 tornado. By far the most important resource that I used for this video was this book, Saragossa, Town Killed by a Tornado by Derwood Lane. It took a lot of time and money to get my hands on this book, but I'm super glad I did. It contains a bunch of different eyewitness accounts from rescuers, from victims, and it outlines the entire timeline of the tornado. If you're lucky enough to have this at your local library, I know it's really rare, but it is out there and you wanna learn more about the tornado, this is the book for you, I highly recommend it. Hope you guys enjoyed this one. If you have any suggestions on what I should do next, leave it in the comments below. Make sure you subscribe for more and I will see you soon.